Welcome to Pikes on Pike, a podcast where the two Pike sisters discuss the works of young adult horror author Christopher Pike. So first, a few words about the author we happen to share a last name with. Christopher Pike had tried to break into science fiction and horror before an editor suggested he give young adult fiction a shot. After the publication of Slumber Party in 1985, uh, which is the focus of our episode today, he gained popularity and joined the ranks of other well-known YA writers, and is often seen as a literary stepping stone for younger audiences between the Goosebumps franchise and the works of Stephen King. To date, he has written around 100 books, including a children's series and adult fiction. So now that you know a little bit about the author, let's jump right in. So what should we talk about first? Um, Do you want to talk about the cover art? Yeah, let's talk about the cover art first. So the cover art for a lot of these like early ones from the 80s have like Mm -hmm. has like a very similar, you know, aesthetic kind of (laughs) to it. And it reminds me it's like the it's like the uh, bright neon, you know, kind of like oh, yeah. uh, jagged, I guess, for lack of a better word, uh, font, you know, which is kind of weird uh, across the Yeah, front. it's like that drippy thriller yeah. font that you see in Microsoft. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I don't know if it's trying to imitate, like, blood or lightning or just, you yeah. know, what. <clears throat> I'd be curious to know who was, who was the person that decided at some point in, like, I guess probably the early eighties into the nineties who decided that that was just going to be the go-to font for like, like Friday the 13th, mm-hmm. their font, it looks just like that. Yeah. And so, well, on Friday the 13th was made what in like the late seventies. So one, but I want to yeah. know who the, who the font authority mm-hmm. was <laughs> just decided that if it was going to be a horror movie, they were just going to make it this neon colored drippy thing. Well, part of me wonders um, too, if it must've been something to do with maybe um, like fonts and style available to publishers because Stephen King, some of his books from the eighties also have this kind of, um, similar font and style. And I wondered, we've spoken about this before, but I wondered if part of it was, uh, meant to kind of mimic that. So, you know, that this was kind of like Stephen King for teens, uh, or something, you know, like they were trying to draw that sort of, uh, that sort of link. Well, yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, a, a cover design like that would make it pretty clear off the bat, even without, you know, necessarily reading the title, that it's going to be a horror mm-hmm. story. And, I mean, especially <laughs> because the cover of uh, Slumber Party, um, it's just like this <laughs> creepy house <laughs> in the snow. So, I guess, actually, without the drippy font, you wouldn't necessarily know. Right. <laughs> it could be the winter sequel of Sarah Plain and Tall. I guess you don't know. <laughs> you Except for, like, see the, the title. two ambiguous figures kind of, like, hanging out in the, what is it, the lower left-hand corner in the window with the... Yeah, there's someone holding a candle. <laughs> like, okay, the... but I guess it could be kind of like, I guess it could be kind of tranquil if you took away the drippy font, um, but still. This is what I'm right, saying, yeah. yeah. It would probably throw some people for a loop. They open it up and it's a bunch of angsty teenagers getting ready to go on a ski trip. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they're driving like BMWs because this is the 80s. And... Right, and everyone drives a BMW. Yeah, and that's like the the go-to status symbol. Right. Well, and it's also <laughs> interesting as if the font and the picture are not enough to kind of drive home, you know, the fact that this is going to be kind of, you know, uh, a suspense thriller type thing. Then you've got like the little teaser at the top, you know, it was eight years later and it was happening again. You know, it's like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, what was, what was happening again? But it's like... It's kind of like you've got, like, layers upon layers. There's not a lot of subtlety, I guess, is in the no. marketing <laughs> of the book. No. <laughs> subtle. Well, I mean, let's face it. Subtlety is not necessarily a teenager strong True. point. So. Yeah. <laughs> they aren't going to pick up on the subtle nuances <laughs> of the various language. Yeah. Maybe not yet, anyway. Although I feel like, you know, these are... I, I, I feel like in some young adult fiction, especially, like, horror mm-hmm. fiction... Um, you know, I don't, I don't think the target audience is the age of the girls that the story yeah. is being written about. Like these girls are supposed to be what, like juniors or seniors in I high school so. or they're, they're varying yeah. ages, but I think they're, they're supposed to be, you know, like in high school, but these books are obviously marketed towards like a, a middle school mm-hmm. crowd because the content is still very PG. Yes. Like, you know, there, there's some kissing right. and there's some like, uh, thinly veiled remarks about, um, the the one male character whose name I can't remember right now. Cal. Cal. Yeah. 
Yeah, and him being, you know, quote unquote handsy. <laughs> right. I think Dana makes some comment about how like being mauled by an octopus or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's just, like, this is clearly, like, it's being marketed towards a a maybe younger demographic, maybe, like, between the ages of, what, like, probably 11 and, like, 14 or 15. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think so, too. But, I mean, the, you had pointed out that the candle on the cover Mm -hmm. art, the candle that whoever that person is supposed Mm -hmm. to be is holding is, you know, symbolic of of things to come. Right. Um, since you know the whole fucking house catches <laughs> on fire. Well, and it's, it's interesting too, because like when I was younger and first reading these books, I used to have like all these kind of, um, you know, guesses about who I believe there are two. I'm looking at it now. Yeah, there are two figures in the window. And I always used to have these guesses as to who, like, which of the characters they were. And I used to like go back in the text because clearly I had way too much time on my hands and like look at the physical descriptions and try and figure out like okay this person looks like they have blonde hair like maybe that's Celeste uh or you know slash Nicole or you know whatever and so I think I also think it's kind of interesting when you mentioned the PG and we can talk about this later but I think one of the overarching themes in his books or like maybe it's not so much a theme as it is a style device I don't know but like the um the concept of sexuality is very pg but the violence mm-hmm. in these books is like oh it's over intense. the top yeah, I mean, he set a girl on right. fire right <laughs> i mean like there's people shooting flare guns and people are being set on fire and there's like scarred tissue from plastic surgery and there's like and it, you know and uh and all these different kinds of things and it's kind of like it's interesting how that I I sometimes wonder if those two things were meant to balance each other out and they didn't quite, you know. Well, and let's also not forget that Slumber Party was his first, like, this is this is the first major paperback, yeah. I believe. This is the first one yeah. he wrote. And it was published in, what, 1985? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, bear, bearing in mind, you know, 1985 versus the time that we currently live in, in like the Game of Thrones <laughs> era. Uh, yeah, it does seem a little bit, it, it, it does seem a little bit odd um but i mean it is also young adult fiction published in the 80s so i mean he couldn't go like totally crazy but you know our goal is to read through all of these in order yeah. so that'll be one one interesting thing to kind of keep track yeah. of like does he kind of let loose do things get pg-13 right. at some point do they even do they even dare i say go to read it they or, probably skirt not. the line um, <laughs> yeah. but one thing so here's an interesting thing to just to go back to the cover art thing for a second, the book that you and I have yes. and had, mm-hmm. you know, when we were little before, I believe our mother threw them all out, um, is the one with with the house in the snow yeah. and the person with the candle. But there's also another version of the cover with a an image of a girl standing in flames. Oh, I have it pulled up on Goodreads right now, um, and I've never seen this one. That's probably. I mean, I'm assuming the ones that we have were probably the first edition. Yeah. Well, they're not first editions, but they were the first round of paperback publishing. Yeah. So that was probably the first cover. And then this one probably comes out later. Cause I know that mm, I don't think all of his books, but a lot of them have been re released yeah. over time. Yeah, they have. I mean, they're still being published. Um, it looks like this one, this version that I'm looking at maybe from 2004. Okay. That's pretty recent. Yeah, it is. I'm actually kind of surprised. I'm just pulling it up yeah. on my phone. But yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a girl. It's presumably one of the characters standing, looking pretty calm for being apparently on fire. Uh, she's blonde. Do we remember oh, which yeah, one of the characters looking, is blonde? Yeah, I just pulled it up. I think it's probably Celeste slash Nicole. Is it Celeste or, or, or is it uh, Laura? Or, 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 well, if is it Lara or Laura? By that the is way. a good question. In my head, I always said. Like, when I was reading this book growing up and I was going through the characters in my mind, it was always Laura. But, I mean, the English mm-hmm. professor in me looks at the spelling of that and wants to say Lara, which is more Irish, I think. Like, in... Is that supposed to be relevant? Uh, well, <laughs> I sometimes wonder if he pulled some of these names, like, how he came to... And I wondered if we were supposed to be saying it with, like, some kind of, you know, I don't know. I mean, I always read it as Laura, but... I don't know. The- yeah. Well, for the sake of this conversation, let's call her okay. Laura because yeah. I'm going to get confused <laughs> if we keep switching back right. and forth from well, Laura to Lara. This, um, let's see. 
I mean, the other thing, the only other, the only other thing that makes me think that in this alternate cover art that um, it might be Celeste slash Nicole is mm-hmm. that she looks pretty young, and she was younger than the other ones. She was younger than Dana and Rachel and Mindy and Nell and Laura. Remember, she because she's the little sister. That's so, right. I mean, but I guess it could be Laura. I just I remember her being. She it seems like she's kind of got that sort of like wide-eyed ingenue sort of look to her, which seemed to be kind of what Pike was going for when he was trying to characterize her. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, But you're right, that's kind of creepy. Another thing that I'll be interested to see as we go through these is how, because he loves to write young female characters. Yeah. Um, I think I read somewhere that he finds them, that they're better to scare not that they're easier to scare, I don't I don't think is what he said, but that they're better to scare. Okay. There's more of like an emotional range, huh. I guess. Hmm. So I'll be interested to see, I guess, how his female characters evolve. Yeah. Um, because they're teenagers, so you're obviously working with, right. again, a lot of things. <laughs> right. And there's a lot of <laughs> angst lot of in angst. this book. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I'll just be kind of curious to explore some other, you know, like maybe teenage themes here and there. Yeah. But, um I don't know. Should we go through the cast? Yeah, of characters? let's do it. So we've got um, we've got the core group of girls. Um, we've got Dana Miller and Laura Johnson and Rachel Grayson and Celeste Winston slash Nicole Kotroff. As we later, I think it's Kotroff. I'm not really sure about that either. Well, uh, but that's how I'm pronouncing it. Uh, and Mindy Casey and Nell Kotroff, who is Nicole's older sister. And then we also have um, the Colonel who is um, kind of this Colonel Sanders figure, which is how <laughs> Pike kind of characterizes Well, I mean, it's a recognizable, America. you know. <laughs> yeah, it's a recognizable image. It just makes me laugh. It makes me chuckle because I always think of chicken, and then I'm like, I don't think this is where my mind is supposed to go. Um, so we have him as kind of a minor character and also essentially as a plot device. Right. Uh, and then we have the two boys, the two um, young men. The love Percy. interest. <laughs> Yes, the love interest, Percy and Cal. Um, And so we've got, I mean, I think this is not a particularly long book. Uh, I think from start to finish, I'm trying to look here, it's like... I think it's like just shy of 100 pages. It's like 170. Oh. From start to finish, yeah. (laughs) Oh, wait, here it is on Goodreads. It's 176 pages, so not shy of 100. (laughs) A little shy of 200. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, for a book that is not particularly uh, long, you know, I read this book um, when we would decide to do this podcast. I reread this book in like one night. And I read, I think the first time that I read it, it was similar, like over the course of maybe like a weekend or something. So for a book that is not particularly long, it has a fairly uh, large cast of characters, Mm -hmm. which I think is something that we can kind of talk about um, as we go through some of these. But I think that's kind of a Pike thing, too. I think he's big on the ensemble cast. Um, well, I mean, that's a big, that's a big you know, horror plot thing because you got to have people to kill, right? <laughs> exactly. You have to have yeah. an ensemble he, yeah. cast because you got to have people right. to kill, <laughs> right? And if you're going to have conflict, which is something else that you obviously need in any kind of successful fictional story, right. then you got to have people to you know create those conflicts yeah. and drive you gotta, that. Yeah, you have to have some, forward. you have to have something, some emotion, some people to drive the drive the plot along, right? Um, so the core group is Dana, Laura, Rachel. Celeste, mm-hmm. who we will call Celeste for the sake of clarity, um, Mindy, and Nell, and Nell, yeah. um, and Dana is well. Laura is like is the main is the main character. The story is from the viewpoint of Laura, right. um, so she's kind of our our main. She's our she's our protagonist. She's level headed. Yes. She's you know she's calm. She's smart. And then you have Dana, who's like her foil. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of love Dana. I know Dana's pretty great. Um, I see myself in Dana because she's just kind of there. Yeah. She's like, "I'm hungry. Can we eat now? Why? I hate skiing. I hate boys. Can I have a brownie?" And I'm just like, "Dana, you're me." <laughs> Dana's all of us. Um, and then Rachel yeah. is supposed to be like the nemesis. She's super pretty, yeah. super blonde. You know, cheerleader type. You know, everybody right. hates her because she's cute, and she's also apparently kind right. of a b-word. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> um, and then Celeste is what she's supposed to be a freshman that Laura just befriends yeah. and just invites on this ski trip out of some sense of pity because she doesn't have any friends, which it's yeah. kind of unclear on, on that part in the story. They, but like, I mean, meet at school randomly or something. Yeah, and, and I think Laura just, feels bad know. because um, yeah. she's like sitting by herself or something, and so she invites her to yeah. go on the ski trip. Um, little do we know that it's a large part of like a larger plot. Um, and then there's Mindy, who's supposed to be the token idiot. Um, <laughs> the boy crazy token idiot. And then Nell, who is... Let's talk about Nell. Okay. Nell is for for the sake of listening and for the sake of clarification, Nell is their friend of all of these girls from childhood who no one has seen in what eight years. Yes. Because mm-hmm. the last time they saw her at a slumber party, they set Nell on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, you know that might put a damper on right. your relationship. So Nell is very badly scarred, um, <laughs> as burn victims, you know, very often tend to be. Um, in the book, he does a really excellent job of flashing back to that slumber party. That was probably yes. my favorite part of that book, where there's a there's a flashback when everything starts to go to shit. In yes. um, Laura is either having a dream or she's thinking about it, and it's a flashback to the slumber party where Nell gets very badly hurt. Yes. Um, and um, presumably, also, I, f- I forgot about this, they kill Nell's sister at this slumber party on accident. Nicole. Um, yep. mm-hmm. who also catches on fire. Yes. Um, and then because they, they don't know anything, because I think they're supposed to be like nine when this happens, they dump alcohol on them trying to <laughs> put yes. the fire out, and which it, as we all know yeah. is a terrible fucking idea. <laughs> it is. Um, yes. So Nell is kind of the friend that everyone's wary of because, you know, they yes. <laughs> fucking killed her sister and they haven't seen her since, you know, she burned herself and since yes. uh her sister her little sister was unfortunately killed um yes so i mean again like this is this is young adult fiction so we're gonna forgive you know obvious you know plot holes or glossing over stuff because it's supposed to be a short read it's supposed to be right you know a thrilling read so um we're, we're gonna forgive some you know literary sins there um but I think it's really like Nell kind of creeped me out immediately. And I mean, I she was yeah. supposed to, right? Yeah. Like she, her character yeah. is kind of menacing, but I did think it yeah. was just kind of hilarious that they were just like, Oh, we haven't seen her in eight years since we accidentally killed her sister. Sure. Let's have a slumber party with her. <laughs> like that won't be awkward right. at all. <laughs> well, and I think the other thing about it too, is that, um, you know, Pike is really big on, you know, um, foreshadowing and I think the other thing that's important here is that um that not just like let's you know go away for the weekend but the house they're going to is Nell's parents it was Nell's idea to invite them Mm -hmm. like this is all her thing and so it's equally menacing and odd because you're like in addition to everything that you have said on top of this it's like out of the blue kind of they she invites them after eight years to this kind of remote location well it's not kind of it is remote um, to go skiing and like hang out at this giant house. And it's sort of like, this is strange, right? Um, I think the other thing that's important, and this is just a um, like a small detail, but it, it becomes important later uh, that Pike sets up in the beginning of the book when we first meet Nell, is that Nell was very badly burned, but mostly on her face and hands because she tried to put her sister out. Right. Um, and so well, it's... Well, that in the flashback, she yeah. also... she. Put, the the whole reason that her sister died is because she pushed yes. her yes. into the fire. Yes. Yes. So on top of which there is also a lot of and we can talk about this too, because it this book is big on this too. But there's a lot of psychological sabotage here oh yeah. in terms of like the sibling relationship and like if you recall in the flashback and then later on all the whole mess with the Ouija board and like there's a lot of setup and to the final they're like, so and drinking. And they're like, let's drink yeah. my parents' brandy. And I'm like, first of all, you pick the right. shittiest liquor of all the liquors right. to drink. <laughs> right. Secondly, yeah, like why do you guys even feel like you need to drink? Like don't you have enough hyperactive energy that you don't need to alter it with, you know, alcohol? Right. And I mean – and I'm not going to say something stupid like, how did they know to drink alcohol? Because let's be real. But right. it's just kind of like, 
Yeah. I was mostly shocked about the fact that they went for like the brandy. And I just was like, that's yeah. just disappointing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, I think that's interesting. But if you recall, if you go back in the text and you even look, and actually we can go back in the text because that is a lovely part about sharing a book. Um, even at the very beginning of that flashback, and I do think it's interesting that you mentioned that it's, you know, the flashback or is it a dream? Um, and I always think that too, because right prior, the entire flashback is chapter four. Mm-hmm. So right, so prior to the flashback at the end of chapter three is when Laura's kind of like, she's taking a shower, she's like lying down, mm-hmm. you know, I think she's just come back in from skiing. So I always wonder, I think Pike meant for it to sort of read as a dream. Um, and I, the only reason that I'm making a point of that is because he does that a lot in some of his other books. Oh. I think he's big on like dreams revealing, you know things and of course is subconscious or whatever um but even at the very beginning of chapter four when this dream flashback is occurring you know you get a sense that the relationship between Nell and Nicole is strained because Nell says you know why do I always have to babysit her because she's your little sister you know you should be happy you have one I'd rather have a little brother who played with trucks all by himself Um, And then further down, just to kind of expound on this group dynamic, um, Mrs. Kutroff says, you know, hush now, we're here. Have you have um, have you guys got all of your things? And Laura, who is also in the car, says, you know, yes, Mrs. Kutroff, Laura said politely hugging her pillow and blanket to her chest. So like you're already I think one of the things that's kind of interesting in this book as it relates to Nell is Laura is our protagonist, but there's a bit of a, and I don't mean this to sound like weird, but there's a bit of a triangle between Laura and Nell and Nicole and slash Celeste, because they, I think you've got these two sisters who are kind of, you know, at odds with one another. And then you've got Laura right in the middle of it because she's, you know, the, like you said, she's the level-headed one. She's the smart well, one. She, she's the one and who she gets befriended. She befriended Celeste and she was the one that right. invited her on. I mean, whether or not Celeste was being used as, I mean, as bait for Laura to invite. I mean, I'm sure that they could right. have gotten her up to that house without Laura having had any interaction with her whatsoever. But Laura was supposed to be right. the girl that like saw her and wanted to be her friend. And yeah. they build a trust which is, yeah. as it turns out, is stronger than the relationship between Nell and Nicole. So, exactly. Um, yeah. Which, let's go back yeah. and let's do, like, a quick rundown of the plot. Sure. Um, so let's see. Um, so they, in this story, um, you know, we meet all of them when they are on their way to uh, the uh, the ski Ski trip. The ski ski trip, ski area. And um, this is kind of a little thing, but it always kind of bugged me. I think the girls are originally from California because there's some references to Oakland, which, and they talk about like Star High or something. West, um, West Star High. West Star High. Thank you. Yeah. And so I assume that they're somewhere, you know, obviously they're somewhere within driving distance. Um, and of course in California, this would work. Uh, so, you know, um, but I was, when I was younger, I always had trouble like locating myself. So they're on the way to this ski trip. Um, and essentially what happens when they get up there, uh, is that the weather, you know, works against them, uh, right from the get go, the weather becomes kind of like one of the major (laughs) antagonists in this book, actually. Um, and so they have to leave their cars, um, with this colonel character, um, which also forces them into sort of a vulnerable position right off the bat. Um, and then through a series of events, they kind of, you know, the Dana and Laura and Rachel and Mindy make it all to the house initially. Um, and they meet now and they talk and, you know, and Celeste, and Celeste kind is of with catch them. up and Celeste and Celeste is there. Yeah. And they all kind of, you know, come together Um, But at the beginning of the book, it's one of the, at the very beginning of the book, when they all show up at the house and they all kind of meet, it's the one of the only times that they're all going to be there together at the same time um, until the very end of the book, which I think is also kind of a horror thing. Um, And then basically what happens through the first half of the book is that, you know, things start to go wrong. Um, Dana disappears 
they meet um, Percy and Cal, and that causes some issues because Rachel and Mindy already met Percy and Cal, but nobody knew that, so that causes some problems. Then Dana disappears, if we're going in chronological order. Um, and then they decide, Laura uh, decides that she's going to have the boys back to the house. Um, and so that sets up some problems right too, and because, then yeah. well when she, they invite the boys which obviously are a love interest so and right. i mean because these are unsupervised teenagers and there's an opportunity to right. invite these boys over and also let's not forget now there's a little bit of an unfriendly competition over percy um yes. between rachel between and laura, laura and rachel. because rachel yep. met him first and then laura met him and percy has decided that laura is the, the better option i guess it's just <laughs> It's always just kind of funny to me how shitty teenagers are to each other, but anyway. Um, so, and then they invite the boys over, and then there's like this interesting kind of rehashing of what happened at the first slumber party. They're sitting yeah. in the living room. They there's a fire. Um, they're playing you a know, game. They're con- they they're still don't trades. know where Dana is. They play a right. game. They're drinking, um, yeah. and then Cal, who is supposed to be. Pike is really good at creating like multiple like like red herrings like who who is the person mm-hmm. that we should be afraid of and Cal is one of them Cal's this aggressive dude he's older he apparently was in the military um yeah. so he's hanging out with like a bunch of 17 year olds and and they never say exactly <laughs> how old he is but presumably he's got to be what in his late 20s if he was At in the military, the yeah, if he yeah. was in the military long enough to have PTSD, apparently, that's another <laughs> thing that they kind of <laughs> gloss over without actually saying it, because I'm not sure PTSD was like a widely used term in, in the mid 80s. Yeah. But anyway, um, so there's this confrontation because Nell is kind of prickly about the fact that these boys are there because they're, yeah. as we find out, they're kind of ruining her plan because they weren't supposed to be there. Um, Right. And then there's a confrontation. Cal pushes Nell. Um, There's this, this fight, you know, he storms out and then that's kind of where everything really starts to go to, to shit deteriorate yeah is kind of there's also a blizzard there, we yeah, should throw yeah. that in so there the, it, well to go back to what you were saying about the fact that the weather is uh, their antagonist from the start the weather has been started to get awful before they even got there but i mean they're going skiing yeah. so who cares but you know there's there's this blizzard it's like zero visibility meanwhile dana is still nowhere to be found and the right. only person that seems genuinely concerned about it is Laura. Everyone else is going, oh, she's back at the lodge. Or, <laughs> right. oh, you know, she went to meet up with Cal because they have like a right. little thing going or whatever. Right. And then Cal says that he hasn't seen her. Laura starts freaking out. Um, and then she has that flashback, that dream about what happened at the first slumber party. Um, yeah. And then she goes a little bit. She basically goes AWOL and she Mm -hmm. leaves the house to go look for Dana. And when she does that, she, she like falls and injures herself. And when she wakes up, she's back at the house. And then you basically come to realize that this whole visit, this whole slumber party, Nell has an agenda. You Mm -hmm. find out that Celeste is actually, um, Nicole. Nicole. Who has had, I guess, a crazy amount of plastic surgery done to not look like she was, like, burned to death. Um, Right. Although I think they clarify, um, I mean, it's been a while since I guess we read this book before we started recording this. Pike clarifies in the flashback that the majority of the burns on Nicole, the burns that presumably killed her, were on her body, not on her face. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of a, a way to hide the, who Celeste really is. And, and then you find out that Celeste is really Nicole and that Nicole actually survived. Um, and that the whole plan for Nell and Nicole was to get all the girls back together so that they could have their revenge. And so Nell, mm-hmm. which is, you know, really violent uh, way to do it, decides to lock them all in the basement with uh, kerosene tanks, the kerosene that's be- being used to heat the house. And right. start a fire and burn them right. to death, you yep. know, as, you know, full circle revenge, yeah. which to go back to your point, you know, the, the romance and, you know, any possible sexual theme is really glossed over. But the violence is pretty intense. You stop and think mm-hmm. about, you know, tying up 
what, like five girls in a basement and setting, putting them basically yeah. in the middle of a kerosene fire? Like, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, eventually uh, they escape. Unfortunately, Nell dies in the, at the hands of her own, <laughs> her own trap. Um, right. And uh, that kind of Nicole and, and can't, can't hurt Laura basically because Laura's right, been so nice basically. to her and Laura. So well, Laura's, Laura's like basically this. Yeah. Yeah. Laura's basically the sister that Nicole should have had. I mean, that's the way I always read that relationship. That's the plot from pretty much beginning to ending. To end. Um, yeah. It's a story of revenge gone wrong, I guess would be the yeah. way to put it. Um, yeah. So, oh, and also to go back, I um, made a note here. You were talking about uh, the geographic location and how it's a little bit unclear. And so we think that the girls are from the San Francisco area yeah. um, because they talk about Oakland. Um, and so we were kind of guessing as to where it was they would go skiing. And I made a note here. Um, that if I had to hazard a guess, if it was a long drive, which it sounds like they had been in the car for a while. It does, um, yeah. It could have been in the Sierras, which That's, that hilariously was guess, enough yeah. is where the Donner Party <laughs> mm-hmm. got stranded. Mm-hmm. So I was like, wow, that's kind of, I don't know if that was intentional. Also, it's just a guess. We have no idea if that's where they went yeah. skiing. But um, it would be kind of funny if we found out after the fact that they were skiing yeah. not far from where the Donner party, you know, yeah. cannibalized yeah. each other. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, well, uh, yeah. And I think too, I just wanted that point that you made about, um, Celeste slash Nicole being burned on her body and, uh, you know, but her face and being relatively unscathed. There's that part at the end of the book where Nell has them all in the basement and everything is out. Uh, and she looks at that, me that uh, mirror that's hanging on the pipe and she it's dusty and she kind of looks at it and she's happy with her reflection and then she clears the dust off the mirror and she her face crumples i'll never forget that word because he he describes it as crumples Mm -hmm. because i'm like that's a very metaphorically rich kind of idea and i do want to talk about some of the writing in this book because he there are moments where he does okay Um, yeah he's actually yeah. yeah and i mean Um, but yeah, but, um, but just to finish that point, like, and she looks at it and she says to them, you know, she touches her cheek and she says, you know, this cheek is plastic. It's not me. You know, I could have been beautiful. And I think that there's this whole, and Celeste is beautiful. I mean, Laura's the smart one. Mm -hmm. Rachel's the sexy one. Mm -hmm. Dana's the funny one. Mindy's the idiot. Um, and, but Celeste is the beautiful one. Like Pike is constantly talking about her eyes and her hair, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, really like how she's got the, you know, and I think that, um, I think that there's the idea too, that this, this construct of beauty and what should have been and the rage that kind of comes from that and how, you know, um, Nell, I think if you look at it, and this is always in hindsight, um, and maybe I'm thinking too hard about this book, but I think when you look at the sixth of six of them, right, um, and you look at that those girls, you almost know from the beginning that like somebody's not going to make it because they're everyone sort of has a role. And while Nell is not, you know, um, while she is important to the plot and so forth, her personality, whether it's because she's kind of terrible or whatever doesn't seem to, you know, bode well for her in terms of overall survival. I mean, I remember reading this book at the very beginning and being like, something bad is going to happen. Well, right. Well, I mean, (laughs) I feel like (laughs) it's good. Right. But I feel like, yeah, really. But I feel like it's good. It's probably not going to end well for her specifically because there's something, it's like she doesn't belong, which is sort of how I think it's been For the entire story, which to just finish this point up and bring it full circle, I think is part of the reason why there's so much tension between her and Nicole, because Nicole does belong. If for any other reason, then she's just an easier personality than her sister. And it's almost like everybody's got their spot and, you know, it's like you're playing, you know, duck, duck, goose. And then at the end, Nicole, uh, Nell's standing outside of the circle. <laughs> like, so I'm like, well, well, you don't have a place to sit. Cause it, it's kind of, you know, it's, it, from the get go, she's, she's sort of the other 
Um, and I think that that's, I just think it's kind of interesting. Well, in yeah, she and is the other and she knows she's the other. Like, she, she knows, knows she's the that, other, you know, yeah. She, and she's resentful of the attention that yes. Nicole gets. Because yeah. the girls, you know, when when there's that flashback to the party where, you know, Nell gets pretty badly burned and Nicole presumably dies. Um, yeah. Everyone is cool with yeah. Nicole being there and everyone's cool with Nicole, which, I mean, if you think about what it was like when, I mean, I'm, I'm younger than you, so maybe you can identify with this a little bit, but like if you had a sleepover, I'm sure there was a time in your, you know, adolescence where you were like, Ashley, go the fuck away. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wants you here. Like, stop crashing my party. Stop trying to hang out with my friends. Go the fuck away. That is, Right. That's a very teenage response. It's a very, it's a yeah. very, uh, it's a jealous response, but it's a human yeah. response, right? Like people do that. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. And so, yeah, yeah like I, yeah. I think that that's a really good point that you made. He's, you know, for all the fluff in this book, yeah. which there's a fair amount of fluff. There's a fair amount of, you there know, is. like John Hughesy kind of stereotypical yes. crap, but there are some themes there where he really nails it. Like, yeah. you're just like, wow. And I mean, that's, a, that's obviously why he, he, he became so popular and why people still like his books because, you know, they're yeah. identifiable without being, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're identifiable, but they're not like, um, I don't know. They're just, they're, they're not too fluffy. Like they're real. I mean, yeah. like while the characters are fictional, yeah, yeah they're mm-hmm. still, yeah, the, these are accessible people, especially to yeah. a younger demographic of, of people. Um, yeah. and I mean, we all had, the thing is, is that I, I hate to say like, oh, they're so stereotypical and like Rachel's the pretty one, Laura's the smart one, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, when you stop and think about the way your friend groups were structured yeah. in mm-hmm. high school, mm-hmm. he's not really too far off. And I mean, like maybe you didn't walk around labeling each other that, but you maybe thought it at least yeah. that maybe you were the smart yeah. one or you knew you were the pretty one or you knew that you that everyone thought you were the dumb one or you suspected that everyone right. thought that you were the dumb one. <laughs> Um, right. so yeah, I mean, like you said, he, he gets it at some yeah. point. Sometimes you kind of, some of it's eye rolly and then sometimes, sometimes you're just like, man, dude. And you're right. Like that scene where she looks in the mirror and her face crumples. It's just like, kind of, it kind of hit you right in the, like, yeah. yeesh. Cause like, you're not right really the, supposed yeah. to like her, but at the same time, like the fact that she got badly burned is not really her fault. No, it's not. Um, yeah. So yeah 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 Um, yeah let's talk about some of the writing that we think worked like i have some examples here i I, one of the things and this is like minor but i i always think he writes um setting very well and -hmm. you know when i teach uh my creative writing classes i'm always going on about setting because i feel like it's something that a lot of my students have a tendency to ignore because they feel like it's sort of incidental you know it's like well it's implied or whatever and i'm like no you really need to ground your reader where you are Mm -hmm. Um, and this is just a small thing, but I feel like uh, he actually does this pretty well, which I think might be easy to overlook unless you're someone who actually tries to do this on the regular. Um, and so I just had like little examples, but like in, even in chapter two, when he's talking about um, the landscape, he says, you know, the once distant clouds on the horizon had gathered gray overhead, putting the landscape through a black and white filter. Like that's a nice description. Mm-hmm. And like, you look at it and you're like, I gotcha. Like I'm with you. Yeah, he's really nailed that um, show don't tell part of yeah. yeah of description. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I thought that that was um, I thought that that was quite good. Um, and there are some other parts there. I'm just kind of looking through my notes where he also um, you know he does a nice job of uh, describing the landscape and also of being very specific, sort of as to. Um, what the space looks like, you know, when he's describing the house. Um, and just so that you, I think, I think that because the weather is such a kind of important component to this story, I think it's also very useful that the setting work because you have to understand kind of what they're up against. Cause otherwise as a plot device, it doesn't really work. Cause you're kind of like, Oh, so what it's snowing, you know, like, who cares? well, exactly. Um, well, and it, and it, <clears throat> and by doing that, then you've, so, you know, the whole thing about having to leave their cars, like, right. how else would he have been able to do that unless he established that the weather was going to be, you know, it all, the, right. or, or, um, 
the, anyway, the weather was going to be like a, a major factor. The other thing that it does is it's really good at creating a sense of panic. You know, the sun goes yeah. down. Laura's still, or not Laura, um, Dana is still nowhere to be found. They're concerned yeah. that maybe she got lost or she fell. Or she um, got hurt. And, yeah. you know, she's freezing to death in a snowbank somewhere. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. The fact that it's cold. Um, the fact that, you know, like Laura feels pressure to go out and look and she can't see shit because it's snowing. Right. The fact that, you know, right. the when she places a phone call um, and the Rangers are like, we don't really want to come up there unless we have to. So it's like this, right. this feeling of isolation. Like it, he really, right. the, he had to do it that way. And he had to, you know, really build up the weather because he had to create this sense of panic and isolation because otherwise you're right like it wouldn't have worked if the story was taking place in summer the only way that it could have conceivably worked would be if it was liter if this house was literally in the middle of a field in like kansas or something right and the closest neighbors right. were like an hour away um right. which is you know unrealistic at best so yeah i love the right. way that he that he described the weather i also just as a as a narrative device i just love it when when people use yeah. the weather to kind of drive things along me too, too. <laughs> me too well there's also the juxtaposition too of course and we haven't really talked about this i mean we sort of we talked around it but like um and maybe this would be a good segue to talk about some of the supernatural elements in this book too because that's a big thing in pike but like there is there's the juxtaposition of the cold and the snow and fire like because fire is a huge i mean right from the get-go you know um Laura notices the tanks and she notices that he talks about the fireplaces when he's describing the house. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's there. Like, he threads it in the entire way. And then, of course, um, and maybe this is our segue, when Dana disappears, Laura, bless her, um, you know, at first she kind of thinks that it might, you know, she may have gone back to the lodge or she may have whatever. But then we get into this whole thing with, like, Carrie and, you know, spontaneous human combustion and someone burning someone with their mind and she and Percy are out digging. Oh, oh you mean fire, <laughs> digging you mean on the, fire starter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 basically. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because when you were showing, when we looked up that alternate uh, cover art, you know, that screams Carrie. I mean, that looks it like... It also screams Firestarter, yeah. though. The yeah, the, right. um, the yeah. movie poster for Firestarter with tiny, with Drew, tiny Barrymore. Drew Barrymore, like, <laughs> is, is, is ensconced in flames, <laughs> basically. Um, but no, you're you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and Laura really buys into that. And, of course, Nell runs with that mm-hmm. because she knows it'll keep Laura distracted. So she takes the bones and stuff from the barbecued pit and dumps them in that concave of ice you know she melts the snowman Mm -hmm. um and you know all these different things and the snowman is one of the first things that happens where everyone's like what's going on um and and i think you mentioned this but i think it's important to kind of emphasize this because it is something it is the one there are a couple things in this book that kind of drive me nuts and maybe that's where we can that, that's our next step is whatever. to identify the yeah. kind of hilarious <laughs> and right. annoying um, things that occur. But one of the things that annoys me about this book, and you kind of touched on, is like Laura seems to be the only one who's kind of using her brain. Like <laughs> the snow, you know, the snowman just melts in the shade and everyone's like, oh, there must be a vent underneath it. And I'm like, what? And then a vent to like, what exactly? Whole... Volcanic right. gases? That was the right. first thing I thought. I'm like, <laughs> you people are stupid. <laughs> and then... We've t- we've talked about this, but the entire Dana arc, I'm like, I don't even. Do you people really not care that much about this girl? Like, that's very strange. Um, I also think, um, and then you can you can go. Uh, but the other thing is sort of a, a broader theme about this this particular book, which drives me nuts. And I suspect that in the earlier Pike books, as we go through, I'm probably going to have problems with this continuously. Is there are parts of this book that are not what I would call particularly feminist. Um, uh, well, yeah, I know exactly where you're going with this. Yeah, with there's this one. some gender stuff going on here um, in terms of like the like the characterization of Mindy drives me absolutely like to distraction. Like <laughs> I I don't understand like what is happening other than the fact that she's constantly chomping on gum and appears to be some sort of airhead. But like her entire like the way that she thinks about Cal and that whole thing, I'm like, what is wrong well, with this? Woman? In her description, um, when Laura is kind of having an, an inner monologue about Mindy, she yeah. describes her as unfeminist. Yeah. But then she also and, went on to describe Dana as a butterface. So <laughs> it was kind of like, okay. <laughs> I mean, 
the thing is, is that you know, like maybe maybe Christopher Pike is is maybe maybe he is you know feeding into these stereotypes because he doesn't view them as stereotypes. Maybe he's just that uninformed. I kind of find that hard to believe. I think he's really just, kind of, I think part of him was maybe trolling the audience a little bit because these are, yeah. these are teenagers, right? And teenagers aren't stupid, right? Yeah. Like I look at teenagers and I see like tiny adults basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But their thought, <coughs> their thought processes are, are kind of like that. You know, yeah. like, oh, well, I mean, get a load of Mindy, boy, crazy Mindy chomping on her gum like some kind of farm animal. Yeah. But she's yeah. she's so unfeminist. And, you know, look how she goes yeah. after Cal. And then, you know, you turn around and you're just like, oh, good old Dana. Like, <laughs> so, you know, only good, you know, basically only a face a mother could love. But funny, at <laughs> least. And you're just like, how'd you bitch? <laughs> I know. Well, and the relationship between Rachel and Laura where it's like, you know, Rachel, because there's the whole underlying plot Yeah, let's line talk really about, gets... let's talk about their, their quote unquote yeah. friendship. I'm going, why are you friends with, like, Laura, if you hate Rachel so much, then why are you, why do you still call each other friends? And like, w- like, what's the problem here? Because it sounds like he paints Rachel to be mature beyond her years, but not like in a yeah. wise way, in a Rachel's yeah. supposed to be kind of a slut way i yeah i think so but i think this also comes full circle to what you were saying we were talking about cal and you were talking about pike's use of the red herring i think rachel's characterization is meant to distract because honestly rachel is the one i mean rachel is competitive and rachel is you know um i think shrewd you know i mean there's that whole thing with like the is it the homecoming queen thing where like yeah um, where she's trying, she knows she can't really beat Laura on personality, so she's trying to, you know, rig the system. Um, and so I think in that way, you know, obviously she has some character flaws, but Rachel is also the one who kind of like, with the exception of Laura in the story, sort of gets stuff done. Like she is the leader. She's smarter and she's, than than her characterization than gives her gives credit. Her credit yeah, for. she's yeah, she is yeah. shrewd, and she's and it becomes clear, you know, while well, everyone is kind of like Mindy's off being Mindy and stupid Mindy. and you know Dana's <laughs> yeah. disappeared and Laura right. is like falling down the, <laughs> falling into this whirlpool of just hyper paranoia um, right. and Rachel's the only one who's calm and you can read that as she's calm because she knows that you know Dana's dead or whatever which it turns out Dana's not but or right. you know Rachel is just not concerned because logically right. she's thinking there's it's it's unrealistic for anything bad to have happened to Dana, so yeah, like yeah. she's characterized as she's supposed to be vilified, but right at the end she turns out to be about just as smart as as Laura, yeah. um, and she probably and she has her head about her, reason. yeah, and she has her head yeah. about her a little bit better yeah. than the rest of them, um, yeah. I mean, by the time you get to the you know the final confrontation in the basement where it looks like they're all going to get fried. Rachel yeah. is the only one who's not totally losing it. Um, yeah. And she's the only one that, you know, is telling them, like, this is what we need to do to escape. Everyone else is freaking out. And Rachel's the one that's like, this is what we have to do. You know? Right. Like, well, and I, I think that, and I think that she, yeah, exactly. And I think the other thing is, I was just looking while you were talking because it reminded me, you know, at the at the very end of the book when they're in the basement, I think this is on page one forty, and um, Laura, Rachel's telling them how what happened to her after Laura and Percy left, um, and how she wound up in the basement, mm-hmm. and um, Laura says, you know, um, I'm sorry because I suspected you as the murderer. Me, Rachel said softly, a sadness in her voice, voice Laura had never heard before. Not me, Laura. How could you think that of me? I overheard you on the phone. And then they we go into the whole, like, you know, homecoming and fixing the balloting thing and that whole nine years. Yeah, I love and that I whole, think, like, she doesn't deserve to be homecoming queen. And in my, when I yeah. read that part, I was like, oh, bitch. <laughs> oh, angst alert. I think angst alert is something that we were going to do, like, a segment. We should probably, like, because there's a couple. Yeah, yeah that was yeah, hilarious. Angst alert, for sure. Um, angst alert was hilarious. The, that moment, yeah, she, that, Rachel, that bitch doesn't deserve to be homecoming queen or something. And then there was something else. Um, um, well, there's well, a there's lot some, of... there's that really kind of um, not I, not PC reference to uh, 
anorexia on page 16 yeah Yeah, where you know I forget exactly what the comment is because I don't have unfortunately I don't have the book right in front of me so I can't read it but um yeah I think Laura is the one that she says like oh I wish I was or Dana says I wish I was anorexic or something because she's lamenting that she's kind of chubby and you read it and you're just like yeesh Jesus here we go here it is um, on page 16. I'm So this is right when they're at the fruit bowl, mm-hmm. I think. Or, yeah. I'm hungry, Dana growled. You're always hungry, Laura said. I wish anorexia was contagious and I knew someone who could infect me. Yeah, see. And that, so Dana says that. Yeah, yeah it's just kind of like, <laughs> like, I mean, I get okay. it from, again, yeah. a teenager perspective because, you know, pe- people say shit like that. But, you yeah. know, it is just kind of funny because then, like, I read it and I was like, God. And then I was like, that's right. This book was published in 1985. Uh, right. <laughs> and there probably yeah. was, you know, not as, uh, there, there was not as much cultural sensitivity uh, to things yeah, like right. eating disorders um, <gasps> right. or probably mental illness in, in general, which I, I was kind of wondering to myself if that's going to, because you've read more of these books than I have, yeah. if, this, if that's going to be a recurring theme. But uh, Angst Alert, for sure, is going to be a recurring theme because this is young adult fiction. (laughs) It sure is. um, And also their interactions with boys, like, that also has to be an angst alert because, you know, Mindy and Dana both are into Cal, or at least for a time. Mindy is crazy into Cal, even though... Pike has done a good job of kind of characterizing him as not really a good target of affection because he's supposed to be yes. like a uh, fucking crazy. Um, Although I do want to come back to him real quick because at the end he like redeems himself. Oh yeah. So that's another thing. Yeah. He Pike. turns out to not be a total shit bag. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. But it's in the, in his actual moments where he's speaking um, mm-hmm. And he's actually interacting with them. As far as the reader is concerned, he's supposed to be an idiot. And meanwhile, Percy's yeah. supposed to be like this fucking white knight. Um, right. But, you know, let's not forget that, you know, Percy originally went up there to meet up with Rachel and then meets right. Laura and decides that he likes Laura better. Pike does a good job of kind of throwing some suspicion on Percy, too, because he kind of disappears and he's yep. he's the one telling Laura, like, I need, you know, like, why are you freaking out? Like, everything's fine, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. And there is the reader. You're going, come on, man. Like, shit's getting weird. Yeah. Why are you trying to yeah. talk her out of it? And then he turns out yeah. to be fine. Um, right. But the, the interactions that these girls have with these boys, you know, like, yeah. Mindy's crazy about Cal, even though he's a dick. Dana, at yeah. first, is you know, crazy about Cal until he, what, like, mauls, mauls her like a bear mauls or something. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So I guess Cal's a little handsy. Um, yeah. And, you know, Rachel and Laura decide that they're going to have this, like, competition over Percy. Mm-hmm. An unspoken competition. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it's just kind of like, Jesus, people. <laughs> like, he's mm-hmm. just a boy. But, like, you, but I mean... You remember going crazy for shit like that when you yeah. were like, you know, 15, 16. Um, yeah. But it is like, it, it, it is definitely like a cringeworthy uh, it component is. to this story, which is probably going to keep popping up in his other definitely. books. Um, just because. Well, and it's, yeah. it's where we end too in this book. Oh, that's Which right. Yeah, Percy hilarious. meets her like, at the hospital and he's like, oh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's just like, so is this like an yeah. implied happy ending? Right. So just, you know, I'm looking at it and it says, let me see. I just, cause this is kind of hilarious. So yeah, they're at the hospital and they're talking about, you know, kind of how things went down. Um, and then let me just find a place for you. So they're all talking about how like some people came separately. Some people came together cause Rachel's kind of, or excuse me, Laura's kind of surprised that Percy ends up showing up. Um, and Mindy says, you don't have room for me. And she's talking to Dana about, because Dana brought her van. So Mindy says, you don't have room for me. Not really, Dana said quickly. In a van, Rachel said. We have room for another person, Laura's mother said. Either of you girls could come back with us. Laura's eyes rolled at the word either. (laughs) Perfect, Dana said. Mindy, you don't mind riding with them, do you? No. Rachel frowned. Why Mindy? Why not Mindy, Laura asked. Why not Percy, Rachel mimicked. All eyes went to him. Hey, leave me out of this, he chuckled. Did Cal come with you, Mindy asked Percy suspiciously. Here she goes again. 
Laura moaned. Not with us, Percy said innocently. Dana had developed a sudden fascination with the lighting fixtures on the ceiling. Is Cal out in your car, Mindy demanded of Dana. I didn't bring my car, Dana muttered. Is he out in your van? Don't be ridiculous, Mindy, Laura said. Mindy lost her wad of gum, of course. Accidentally stopping your foot on it. Is he? Dana was fixing her blouse. Well, she began. The copy shop all over again. Oh, God. The exception of her mother. <laughs> they all rode home in the back of Dana's van. Never a dull moment. And that's the end of the it's book. It's kind of a clumsy ending. Like, yeah, it's yeah, just like you're this, like, this okay. never-ending, like, drooling... <laughs> <laughs> God, <laughs> where you just kind of want to reach into the story and go shut up, just shut up. Right, we could have just ended it at the hospital, like just. Well, you know, I always like. I know. mean, and I'm not trying to be like hypercritical because I've never mm. had a book published. <laughs> but, right. Um, right. Uh, for right. me, that story could have ended after the fire. That the story oh, really yeah, no, could totally. have just ended yeah. after the house, you know, fucking. Ex- Right. right. Because the other thing that kind of um, bothered me about that ending is, you know, okay, so Nicole was also at the hospital. Yes, yeah, she was. Um, yeah. Her sister's dead. N- right. Nell has died. Right. Their parents have lost a daughter. Yeah. It ends. Right. Like, I just, I thought it was kind of a cheap way, that whole and, and right. the hospital ending and then, like, the ride home and whatever. I thought it was kind of a cheap way to end it yeah. because otherwise like we just ended a really kind of dark story like somebody just burned to death in a right. basement you know in in right. this in this giant you know a, a, like ski lodge right. in, in the woods right. and you know now we're just gonna you know oh here we go again and it's like no no here we don't go again somebody died right <laughs> like, well, and the other thing that I thought was interesting about that, and again, this is something else, this being the first one, but I think, you know, I do think Pike is big on the epilogue, um, which I don't think is always to his service. Right. And I don't think that's just a Pike thing. I think that's a writer thing. I think knowing when to stop sometimes is something that people don't necessarily, they're not as good at as they should be. Right. Um, well, this but, is also his first book. book. So one yeah, other thing that I'm kind yeah. of excited to see as we go along is how some of these, you know, like we talk about like some obvious plot holes, um, Mm. some characterization issues, like some of these tropes. Um, I'll be interested to see how his style evolves the further we get into this, because, you know, like I said, I'm, 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 I don't want to be hypercritical because a, it's his first book B I've never had a book published. So I don't really like where do I get off being so critical? Um, (laughs) but I will be interested to see if, like, maybe some of the characters step away from some of the yeah. stereotypes. If maybe yeah. he steps away from that epilogue format. Yeah. If yeah. Um, maybe he lets the story end on a dark note. Part of me wonders yeah. if, you know, it's if he ended it that way also, you know, because it's 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 young adult fic- fiction. And, you know, yeah. this was like pre Hunger Games pre Harry Potter where, you know, like if you're writing for children, you don't necessarily want to end on a dark note because like, it's too dark. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, and, Mm -hmm. and now it's like, who cares? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, shit that, you know, uh, just to use hunger games as an example. I mean, that's about kids killing other kids. Like that's a a pretty dark subject matter. Um, right. But so, you know, I, you have to take into account like the era that this was written in. And I don't think anyone right. was particularly comfortable with, you know, killing a bunch of teenagers and then letting it end on a dark note. So I have to kind of forgive him for that. But at the same time, like, I really wish he had just ended. Some yeah. Party after the fire. At that and moment. It, it could have yeah. like, it, it could have just like hung there and, you're, and then you, you right. close the book and you're just like, Ooh, shit. Right. Um, right. But that's just my opinion. Um, but yeah, we'll yeah. have to see what some of the other books <laughs> yeah. show us. This is going to be um, a, an interesting and fun project. Yeah, it is. And I think, um, I do think it's interesting. I was just thinking about, um, and this might be something to look up for next time, but I was just thinking about what you were talking about um, with uh, what was going on in a young adult fiction during this time. And what might be interesting to consider, too, is that when I think about young adult fiction, um, you know, I think of these, 
what I was reading when I was this age. I think of these. I think of R.L. Stein, which might be an interesting thing to just kind of take a glance at as comparison. I think of the Babysitter's Club, which is about as far away from this as one can <laughs> yeah, get. Yeah, the other end of and the I, spectrum, yeah. And I think of things like Sweet Valley High, which you want to talk about angst. Yeah, um, I never read any Sweet like, Valley High. Um, I only read a few. That's a little bit too, um, I was a little bit too young. Right. That. And I, I didn't really, I didn't get into it. Like I was bored by it. So I only read like maybe three or four of them, but, um, and that's the one thing I'll give Pike is like stuff happens in his books, mm-hmm. which sounds lame. But let me tell you, if you're reading YA from the eighties, stuff doesn't always happen. Um, and so well, and a I lot think of it's that, like romance you know, fluff, right? You know, because it, it, right. these are mostly geared towards teenage girls. And teenage right. girls, or at least the perception at the time, was that teenage girls wanted to live in these fantasies that they were playing out in their own minds. So, you know, right. the ugly duckling dating the captain of the football team. Um, right. Because that's what they thought they wanted. So I think that Christopher Pike kind of, well, and R.L. Stein too, because he was writing, I think, around the same time, but I think he came a little bit later. Or maybe earlier. Yeah. I don't know. We'll look into that. Well, um, but he, yeah. you know, they, mean, filled, yeah. they filled a... Um, they kind of took over a corner that wasn't really there. But then once yeah. they kind of took it over, people were like, oh, this is interesting. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. I think um, we should probably do some investigating into what young adult fiction was like starting in, like, the mid-'80s. Um, I mean, yeah. when I was the age you were when you were reading these, because I read these when I was younger. Um, right. But when I was probably 13 or 14, I was reading Harry Potter, which right. is – which, is, which gets dark. Yeah. I mean, the first couple yeah. of books, you know, you're like, oh, la la la, wizards. <laughs> and then yeah, you get to like right. the third book and they kill Buckbeak. And <laughs> then you get to the fourth <laughs> book and people just, start dying. And you're just yeah, like, Yeah, and things oh. just go downhill from there. Um, yeah. So yeah. It, it's just yeah. kind of funny, you know, to have grown up reading those kinds of stories and then to go mm-hmm. back and read something like Christopher Pike. You know, it, it, it is periodically gag worthy, but yeah. you have to appreciate you know, the fact you have to appreciate what he wrote. I mean, I still think slumber party was a fun read. I mean, these books are going to be fun. I did too. Um, I did too. I thought it was really fun. I liked rereading it again. Um, and I think that his books are entertaining and I think that there's something to be said for that too. mm -hmm. Um, and quick and easily digestible. You could read. I I think think I read this book in like two days. Oh yeah. It's not a lot of it's dialogue (laughs) and a lot of it's just back and forth and you're just kind of like, okay, that's (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> right. Again. And it goes it goes fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, maybe we should tease. What's the next one? What's number two? Uh, the second book is Weekend. Yeah. Um, that one. So Slumber Party was published in 1985. Weekend right. was published in 1986. Um, say what you want about Christopher Pike, but the man is prolific because he put sure out is. on average. I'm seeing here a book to uh, one to two books a year yeah which is not a small feat no it is no small feat again seeing as neither you or i have written a single (laughs) no (laughs) working on it yeah working on it um but you know and this is so just to clarify um we are going in chronicle excuse me we are going in chronological order but we are at least for now, keeping away from the series, we'll probably get to those. Um, yeah. But he did a couple of series. There's the Chain Letter he series, did. Final Friends, which yeah. I have a couple of yeah, those. The did. Last Vampire. Yeah. We'll get to those. But for now, we're starting with just his standalone young adult fiction. So the next book that we'll be covering is Weekend. Um, so yeah, we'll have to see what's in store. It's probably going to be another slumber party. <laughs> like, what do, you, do you remember what Weekend's about? <laughs> I do. I know all okay. about it. You're going to you're going to love it. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to love it. It's going to be so fun to talk about cuz I can't even there's so much ridiculous stuff in that book. We're going to have the best time talking about this. Yeah. If we had a good time, if we talked about this book for about an, hour. an hour and 20 minutes, yeah. <laughs> we're going to have to like put 2 hours for weekend cuz weekend is crazy town. Excellent. You're going to love it. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, I think that's pretty much it. I think we covered it. Sir. Okay. First episode of Pikes on Pike. Pikes on Pike. Yay! Yay. Thanks for listening, and be sure to join us next time.